Good afternoon, everybody. Awesome. Uh, thank you for coming here. Um, I'm Harpreet, and uh, of course you know him. He's Kosuke. Hello. And uh, I've learned two things as a speaker. One, you should not stand between people and their lunch. And two, you should not, not stand between people and Kosuke. So <laughs> I'm going to get through my section fairly quickly. Um, but before we start, you know, thanks to all the sponsors for making this event happen. Um, and in today's talk, we'll touch upon a few uh, CloudBees products, uh, just so that everybody, sort of I bring people on, on the same page. Uh, CloudBees has three products uh, uh, in three areas. So we'll touch upon the on-premise ones, which is Jenkins Enterprise and Operations Center. And the Operations Center, and we affectionately call it Jockey, uh, was built sort of as we talked to a lot of people and, and you know, as they're trying to scale Jenkins and we brought those lessons home and we built that product. We also do Jenkins as a service. So there, we host the masters and slaves for you in the cloud and it's completely elastic. And we also have this hybrid solution where if you are using our masters in the cloud and you want to connect back to resources back in your environment, we, let, we do that. Or if you're using uh, Jenkins Enterprise or Jenkins, and you want to use our Elastic Slaves, you can connect back up there. Uh, with that out of the way, uh, the agenda, and this is really two talks in one, so you'll see me going in this rapid mode. Uh, you know, each of them usually takes about an hour to do, so I'll talk about running Jenkins at scale, and the second thing that Kosuke will talk is workflow. Um, yeah, so you know, I talked about workflow a little bit, but uh, we're going to go a lot more detail into the remaining time. All right. So as people bring Jenkins on board, I, I see you know, they have like usually two patterns in there. So one is coming in from top level, you know, we want to do continuous delivery this year, or thou shalt do agile this year. Um, and the second is a sort of a, you know, a viral approach, and we'll talk about both. Uh, to kind of put uh, things, you know, to give context about this picture, whenever in India uh, you buy new hardware, it does not matter what it is, uh, it's a car or an engine, you put a lot of garlands on it and you pray to God that it works for you, right? So when it's going top-down approach, you, we come across admins you know, and teams who are looking at things and they, they decide, uh, well, what kind of tools do we use? All right, we'll use Jenkins in most cases. They make a good estimate on what kind of hardware they need, what kind of executors they need. You know, it's all up and new and shiny, and we'll bring one team on board, make them successful, and then we'll bring other teams on board. And that's the pattern when you're kind of uh, going top down. And if you're successful, if you're lucky and you're successful, this is what your you know, engine starts looking at for a period of time, right? You've boarded, onboarded a lot of teams, and, and they're all successful. That's fantastic. But at this point, uh, if you're an admin, it's, it's a problem, right? How do you manage these things? So if we kind of scratch this, and, and at that point, they look at this and say, like, look, whatever we started off with, you know, this, this small thing that we started off with was clearly not enough. Let's scale this baby up. And that usually means uh, let's add some hardware, let's add some executors, my performance isn't doing well, let's add some JVM sort of options and scale this baby up, right? And uh, I know, you know, few uh, people that we've talked to who have put in literally thousands and thousands of jobs on one master, right? And, and that's great. But once they get to this point, uh, you still have a problem because this is what your instance starts looking, right? This is one instance. If it goes down, all hell breaks loose. And the, the customer that, the, the client that I have in mind, they actually have a production support team, first line support team, supporting the Jenkins support team. So it's like you get into this place, which is when is the next point of failure? So the next approach that people take is scaling Jenkins virally. And in this, you know, it's more grassroots and, you know, somebody brings Jenkins in. They make it successful, and uh, teams come on board. It's going on successful, and at some point, uh, the next team looks at this, and they have this Jenkins envy, and it's like, I would like that. You know, let me make my team look successful. And soon enough, other Jenkins start popping around, and there's Jenkins everywhere, right? 
So they're masters and they're slaves. They're all great. And this picture is kind of pretty, right? It makes you feel like uh, there are homogenous Jenkins instances all living happily. But in reality, your Jenkins kind of looks something like this, right? Operations teams had some masters, and development team has some masters. QA has some masters that they have scrounged from somewhere. And there are problems with this approach as well. Now, if you're at this point, you're successful. Your teams have been onboarded. They are doing agile, and, and all that is great. But it's kind of not good for your bottom line. And the case I remember is back at Sun when I was in, when I was in engineering, uh, the dev team, uh, the QA team ordered you know, machines for a product release worth $100,000. The dev team for the same product couldn't use those machines. They ordered another set of machines for $50,000. And the VP at the top level goes looking at this as like, we've ha ordered 150 k worth of machines. Why, why couldn't we just use it? It's, it's not good for my bottom line, right? The next problem that ends up happening is what we call security by intention. Um, so if you kind of go back to that scene where you had three sort of teams, one is the operations team has this you know, crack security experts, you know, Bruce Lee's of the organization securing things up. And the QA team has a child with a, you know, a sword, or the dev team is protected by puppies. Right? It's like there's, there's no homogeneity here. And, uh, and this is sort of put somewhere up on the wiki internally that thou shalt have these kinds of uh, security permissions. These are the roles allowed. But the next thing you know, it's changed, right? Uh, another thing that comes up is if you have a proliferation of Jenkins, it's like, where is that Jenkins that I care about? The QA team comes in and tells the dev guy, your job did not, you know, your commit caused an integration problem. Uh, all right, where is that job? Give me the URL, give me the password. And in this environment, if you are the admin, you know, this, is, this is what you look like, right? So as we talked to people, it became clear that scaling Jenkins uh, uh, vertically wasn't really the right way to go. There's, there's a middle ground between vertically and horizontally, and that's where Operations Center by CloudWeas or Jockey uh, comes in. So one of the first things that we started looking at is doing... Uh, uh, sort of sharing resources. How do you share slaves? And how do you sort of, sh uh, so what Jockey at, at the top level does is it lets you connect a lot of masters to one single uh, operation center. And that operation center becomes your sort of insight into what's happening within the organization. So one thing that happens is you can share slaves. Uh, you have one crack team of security experts securing your dev, QA, and production machines. So it's not secure by intention. Um, there is a, you know, a breadcrumb that tells you how to get to a particular master. So you land up on a particular master, and from there, uh, you land up on the operation center, and from there, you land up onto the particular master. So it's not like uh, you know, bookmarks and bookmarks of Jenkins instances everywhere. So that's what it does conceptually. This is how it looks. So your operation server is a Jenkins server. It has certain sets of plugins that we built at CloudBees that lets you connect and talk to different masters here. And uh, at the top level, what you can think of those slaves as the internal you know, cloud slaves. And these cloud slaves are shared across machines. Now, in this case, the uh, ops team has its own local slave. So you can set up this architecture where certain teams have their own slaves and they can sort of, uh, when you know, that's uh, not available, they can tap, you know, tap into the cloud slaves. Now, at this point, if uh, one of the teams kicks off a job, they actually talk to the operations server. It lends sort of machines back to those, uh, to those masters. Um, and those jobs run on those slaves. Once the job is done, it goes back to the operations server. Now, <laughs> The, the next thing that happens is the security configuration is set up at the operation center server, and that's being periodically synced back to the individual masters. So that way you don't sort of, uh, you're not dependent on, you know, in, uh, downstream masters having their own security. It's all managed from top, up, upstream. Now, what this actually does is it kind of leads you to this architecture uh, uh, which we've started talking about, right? So 
Uh, there are a number of images here, so let's, let's break this down. So in the, oper uh, in the orange is the operations team, uh, the, uh, the admin team for the operations center. And what they're going to do when they try to set it up, as I said, it's just a Jenkins instance, is uh, they will set up, use, so, so one of the things the operations center does is uses our Jenkins enterprise product and picks up a few of the plugins from there to, uh, uh, to provide more features. So one of the things you do here is we'll use, use the backup plugin to set up a backup job so you're periodically backing up Jenkins. You will, as part of your backup, you know, your uh, site backup, you're running an HA instance up there. So there's an HA plugin within Jenkins Enterprise. So if the primary goes down, a backup comes up and picks up. All that is fronted by a reverse proxy, but all that reverse proxy is doing is if the primary goes down, this, people don't have to remember the URL for the second read automatically uh, pushes, uh, uh, you know, uh, pushes you to the uh, backup instance. You set up the roles-based access control by using the role-based access control plugin from Jenkins. Uh, there is an update center plugin which helps you set up update centers easily. So if you were at Andrew's talk and he was talking about managing your uh, plugin garden, uh, that's what you would use to manage your plugin garden. And then you have these you know, shared build nodes that will be shared across. Now let's say that uh, you want to onboard a particular team. In this case, it's the enterprise QA team, and that's in red. It's the same pattern that you'll follow, the one that you set up with Operations Center. You'll use the backup plugin, set up backup jobs. You'll set up HA, you'll connect that through reverse proxy, and you will connect that to the Operations Center. At this point, the enterprise QA team can actually run um, you know, jobs. Now, the enterprise dev team is somewhat special. They want to have their own local clouds. So again, what you're doing here is setting up the backup job, you're setting up an HA instance, you're connecting that to the Jenkins Operations Center, and you've set up some slaves, but these slaves are not going to be shared with the red team. And again, going back to Andrew's talk, he was talking about a testbed environment, and if you want to set up a testbed environment, you would do the same. You would just connect it back here and connect it to the Operations Center. Uh, you will set up update centers as you brought all these teams up, you can set up a individual update center for that particular team. So in this case, the QA update center is set up for the enterprise QA team, and the dev update center is set up for the enterprise dev team. But once you do that, you get to this place where now you have this repeatable pattern that you can bring on teams, right? And if you go back to that Burj Khalifa picture, which where you had one mega, master, uh, one mega master that was doing everything, you've now moved away from something like that to this, this world where you are bringing masters up for individual teams, right? And this also ties back to Andrew's talk where he was talking about setting up multiple Jenkins and not loading one master. Now, the advantage with this approach ends up being, um, one, for one, uh, there's a repeatable pattern. I've talked about that. Two, uh, the masters aren't heavily loaded. Now, there are not 10,000 jobs in the master. There's perhaps a few thousand jobs. So they don't fail too often, right? And if they fail, they come back. So your mean time between failures increases, and your recovery time for, from individual failure uh, decreases. So that's sort of what the operations center lets you do. And this is something that we at CloudBees have started uh, talking to people about if they wanted to scale Jenkins. And now I'll give you a quick demo of what this looks like. Um, given the sort of the time uh, restrictions, I'm just going to show you the operation center, uh, operation center and show you the shared nodes and how that is set up. And I'll just show you how you can use uh, setup security and how that's pushed down to individual masters. And at this point, you start imagining that there is a Jenkins server. No? Oh, there it is. Oh, I'm just messing with you. <laughs> so, all right.
All right, thanks. Uh, so we are at the operation center uh, landing page. What you see here is uh, I've connected three shared slaves. So these slaves are being shared across all masters that are connected here. As you see, this is your familiar Jenkins page. So if you are uh, you know, managing Jenkins, it's not a new tool that you're uh, using. You're just bringing something on board. Um, I've set up connected a Jenkins master to this. So when you do that, uh, creating slaves and masters and connecting them is a, just a new job type. Once you do that, uh, there's a handshake that happens when you're setting up Jenkins uh, A, which is the client master. Um, this Jenkins A actually uses an update center, which I've created through the update center job type that comes as part of Jenkins Enterprise. So uh, if I click on there, now I am on the Jenkins A, which is being used by this. This is an equivalent of the enterprise team that I was showing you on the previous image. And uh, again, this is no different than your regular Jenkins, so it's, it's pretty nice. I have set this up in an HA mode. Uh, and I wanted to show that. Uh, and in the meantime, notice that the, uh, it's, this instance is already locked in as hybrid, so there's a single sign on that sort of spans across the entire Jenkins. Yeah. Um, the other interesting thing that happens here is from a RBAC perspective. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, so if I go to the Manage Jenkins page and I go to the high availability status, and we've actually set this up in one Jenkins. I apologize for that. So uh, from a RBAC perspective, what I've done here is created this secret project that uh, only few people have access to. And uh, for some reason, um, uh, you know, Kosuke must have said something to me. I did not give him access to this, uh, to this uh, project. So if I log in as Kosuke, so this one, sorry. So let me log out. Yeah, that's, the screen being small makes it a bit tricky. Let's log in as Kosuke. And um, so Kosuke is a developer. He has a lot of permissions on here, except I don't want him to see the secret job, uh, secret project. So if you come back to Jenkins A, you see that uh, you know he he no longer he cannot see that job. But the key point is the RBAC plugin really works with well with the folders plugin, so you can set up permissions on a particular folder. And uh, you can add permissions and you know, add roles and subtract roles if you have like nested hierarchy, that it becomes fairly useful. So with that, I'm going to switch off from the demo and uh, just go on to the next two slides before I give this to you. Am I on time? Yes. I am on time, all right. So as I said, uh, the operation center uses a number of Jenkins uh, enterprise plugins, and I talked about a few. So I talked about backup. I talked, you know, you saw folders up there. I talked about RBAC but, and high availability. But there are a number of other plugins out there that you can use in your environment as you're building, you know, the scalable sort of architecture. Um, uh, I was looking at Andrew's talk, and he was where he was talking about the plugin. Uh, you know, garden and managing your plugins well. The plugin usage plugin sort of pops out very well because it gives you a view of all the plugins that are being used and which jobs are using those plugins. So if you are managing plugins you, and upgrading it, you have a good idea of uh, which teams are going to be impacted so you can inform them of that. Uh, Jockey, uh, we just released Jockey 1.1 as of this week. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that we've added is support for Windows uh, Cloud. Uh, and the second thing that we've added support for is monitoring. And I didn't get a chance to show that to you on, on the earlier screen. But the idea here is on the operation center screen, you can actually look at all the masters that are connected and get an idea of how they are performing. So uh, perhaps it's not clear here, but in addition to the system load that's happening, you know, and the JVM uh, characteristics or files being used, you, are st you start getting view into how your build queues look, 
uh, how often are jobs being scheduled, how long does a particular build take. So you can look at Jenkins-specific information as you're managing across uh, your infrastructure. So with that, uh, I, I will hand off to Kosuke. And as Kosuke is setting up, uh, I'll give a motivation of, uh, of workflow um, in, in this context of this talk. So as we've talked to a lot of people, it became very clear to us that building you know, huge pipelines, and as you saw from the previous talk, is one of the key things that people are looking to do with Jenkins in, in a uh, big environment. And the workflow feature addresses that. Kosuke, all yours. Yes. So, um, so I already talked about so the, the general idea of this functionality in the audio today. So today, this, in this part, I wanted to go a bit more deep dive. Right. So um, just to set the context a little bit, uh, when we say, for example, the complex orchestration that requires this kind of feature, you know, what are we really thinking about? So one, for example, you know, this, we wanted to be able to do this kind of multi-stage continuous deployment pipeline. You know, I had some example of that earlier today. But it's sort of like a, just, a, in a way, tip, just, just a tip of the use case. For example, um, you know, nowadays it's very easy to have a elastic test servers that you can set up and spin down. So these things, it, you know, what if you can have, you can create this temporary server instance during the build and then run a series of things and then you, what if you could then throw it away in the end? What if you could juggle two things, like a blue deployment environment and green deployment environment, and slowly move the traffic over from one side to the other at the end, as a part of the workflow? That's the kind of thing we wanted to support. Now, in Jenkins play, uh, cluster, you can have a lot of slaves. So what if you know, we could allow you to define, utilize this large number of slaves very well by automatically splitting your test into multiple you know, the seats and then run them in parallel and then bring the result back up. So that's really the kind of thing we are trying to do. So this is not just meant for the, uh, the buzzword, it's actually meant for the all sorts of practical use cases. And when we observe this kind of complicated orchestration, like what are the building blocks we see? Well, one is that the, you know, the pipeline itself could involve these multiple distinctive stages that you want to see in the UI. But also, there are a lot of times you need the non-sequential part of the logic. You know, you want to be able to loop through certain things. You want to be able to fork off the multiple execution and join back, um, that kind of thing. The long-running part I already covered. Um, and then the, I think the next part is also actually quite important. That is, we want to be able to accommodate a long pause that's involved having some human checks and balance in the part of the workflow. So you might have a deployment pipeline that uh, the, every step of the way that might be completely automated, but you still, I think, might want to have a stakeholder review and decide when the, the change actually hits the target server. So in this context, the humans are working within this confinement of the, the automation that's putting the whole thing together. So you know, this kind of a human pose is actually a big part of the work. So, um, the startable builds, um, I mentioned this, I guess, the, this, the startable, yeah, the startable build, I mentioned this in the earlier part of that today, you know, the idea that, okay, you don't want to always go back to the top of the, uh, the workflow, you should be able to restart from somewhere in between to avoid wasting things. Um, and then the fact that the part of this is done as a, uh, well, the fact that this is done by using programming language is to promote the reusable pieces. You know, the, we know in this programming language how to build abstractions like classes and functions that allows you to do reuse. So that is a very important part of this story. So with all these things in mind, you know, this, when we look at the script like this, you know, what, what we are trying to achieve here is the fact that this is just really a program that runs from the top to the end. And then all these things that looks like a function call is actually a function call. Um, and then so you see these individual things, individual calls. So we call them a step. It's a, like a bit more general, generic than uh, what we have today as a build step. But these are all, all pluggable. And the key feature that I already mentioned includes this, you know, the, um, you know, the fact that the whole thing is the concise Groovy script, so it's really easy to author. You know, the, the fact that the Jenkins can be distorted while the workflow is going. So like, you know, the program might be executing somewhere here and there, and then you can just like a zap the Jenkins instance and it will come back up and it will still magically remember what it was doing. But beyond that, um, perhaps it wasn't obvious when I just showed this like a screenshots, like uh, I mean the uh, script like this. It's the fact that 
this is a single workflow could actually talk to multiple not build slaves and then access the workspace at the same time. So if you wanted to, you know, have say multiple installer packages built in different machines at the same time, you could totally do that. You could copy stuff in between, uh, that sort of things. And this is packaged as a sort of like a regular looking normal Jenkins project type. So you can continue to use the, uh, the existing SCM extension point. We had to make a few changes, but um, the Git integration you'll see in the demo later is basically just coming from the real Git plugin. You know, being able to copy artifacts, use the build, publish, and so on, those are all part of the design goal. So the you know, one of the sort of key technology behind the scene that enables some of this functionality is basically this idea of how to resume the running Groovy program. You know, if you think about it, it's like a thread. If you think of it as a regular Groovy program, there's a thread going through this program, executing functions somewhere, and now the Jenkins should go down, so like how can we keep the state? So um, for those of you who went to the computer science in the, uh, in the college, um, this is, we actually use this uh, mechanism known as the continuation passing style. So effectively what we are doing is um, we use the Groovy compilers functionality to let it build the AST of the Groovy source code. And then we basically transform that into a more, the form that's more suitable for this kind of persistence. And uh, there's a, you know, we wrote a, kind of like a Groovy interpreter by using lots of lower level Groovy pieces. And that's the one that executes this program one step at a time. So at any point in that program execution, we could hibernate execution, persist every variable state, and then bring it back up later. So that's what makes this whole thing possible. Now, some of the va variables in questions aren't very well serializable, like a workspace, a particular slave. So behind the scene, we use what we call as a pickle to sort of hide how we handle these things. And also, when we bring back that execution state, we need to, we want to reallocate the same slave. We want to reallocate the same workspace. So that's the, thing, that's the kind of magic that goes on behind the scene. But that's, in a way, that's all just implementation detail. And from the point of view of the user who used the workflow, you know, it looks as if the program state is just magically persistent and come back. The only caveat, only thing that you'd see is that the variables that you'd use there, like a local variables and so on, um, they all just get serialized, so they better need to be serializable. So you can't, for example, have a database connection in there and you'd expect that to persist through. Uh, so um, that's that. And um, be beyond that, so we know that when, in reality, when we say Jenkins should go down, most of the time what happens is that when we are forking off a build, like when we are forking off a process, like a Maven process or a test process, that's really the, by far the longest amount of time you're talking about. So that primitive has a dedicated special support for this asynchrony. Um, so they be able to remember where they forked off a process and they'll have the processes right up their log file into separate location so that we can come back to it uh, when the Jenkins comes back. Um, and then, so these are all, you know, these are all done in open source. The, um, one of the features that we are thinking, uh, CloudBees is thinking to do in the, uh, or Jenkins Enterprise by CloudBees, is the ability to resume from the checkpoint. So um, it's capable of doing some extra, like, state de dehydration, like copying files into the right location and so on, and that you could define. But um, the, otherwise, it sort of like uh, magically works as if we are sort of going back in time, and thanks to this earlier the CPS transformation. Now, the other thing, the other part of the well, one important, I guess, implementation, the sort of one of the primitive, one of the steps that we implement that's sort of very useful in the context of continuous uh, deployment pipeline is called uh, stages. Um, and then we sort of we affectionately call it the James node operator in respect of the guy who invented this. And you know, he, he actually made a whole JUC talk out of this, of well, this, the way of throttling execution. So the general idea is, okay, so if you mentally picture like three-stage pipeline process, so maybe you're, let's say you're building some kind of web app. So you, know, you, have, a, you have some kind, like a Maven compiling a program and generating a web app. And then in the second step, you have a, integration test that runs through Selenium. So you want to deploy your web app and then run some battery of tests, and at the end of it, it go, go, go down. And then the third stage is the deployment to, let's say, like a user acceptance testing environment. So if you mentally picture something like this, 
one thing you didn't notice that is that because there's only one UAT environment, it does not make sense to run the deployment step, multiple deployment step at the same time. So they have to be nicely like staggered and essentially like mutually exclusive. On the other hand, the build, the compilation and unit testing, that can run in parallel. So we don't mind running lots of them at the same time. And then the same goes to the integration test. Let's assume that you have a, you can spin up, a, say, Tomcat instance on the fly, um, and then you could run the uh, Selenium test as many as you want. So these stages actually not only have they have a sort of like a you know comprehensive impact. Um, well, not only these stage distinctions are meaningful to humans; they actually have some meaning to the programs, the meaning to the Jenkins, because uh, when the test is over and they move into deployment, you kind of want it to wait. So if you look at this chart, so this is time axis, and then that's the uh, number. The, these are the commits that's coming in to the uh, repository. So if you're testing every commit separately, as a change comes in, they kick off the number of builds, and then they happen at the same time, and ditto for the selenium test. And when the first one is over, well, we start executing deployment, but while well, this is going on, and the second build is over, the uh, second testing is now over, and now this cannot go into the deployment, so you basically wait, pause until the slot become available. And while it's waiting, another build will come along, and that has finished testing. So at this point, because the build three would subsume build two, there's no point in uh, you know, continuing this guy. So the, what the, one of the key cracks of the uh, James Node operator is that as soon as this happened, all right, so we don't need any more build two. So this is subsumed by build three, so we're going to cut that. Like it's up, it gets sort of eliminated at, sort of prematurely. Um, and then, so this is now the uh, deployment is over, so like the, the three would immediately start deploying and so on. So that's the general idea of how this kind of sequencing works. Okay, so that's the, um, the general setup. And then, so what I'm going to do is, let's see, I have to uh, switch to different Jenkins instance. So um, in this test setup, I have a, so this is the new workflow job type. Um, you can create it like you create a normal job. So uh, if you go to the new item, you see that there's a workflow setting here. So that's how you create them. Um, so back to uh, the top page. And if you look at it, it's basically just, you know, it's a regular Jenkins job. You know, you have all the familiar things in you where you expect. The only real difference here is just in the configuration page. If you look at that, um, instead of having these, um, having uh, the freestyle configuration form, you have, like in this case, one big text box that has the workflow definition. So this is a bit involving, so let me just cut and paste this into a editor where hopefully we can see this a little better because it's sort of worth explaining a little bit. Um, so again, this is a program that runs from top to bottom. The idea is, um, so what we are trying to do here is first, uh, we're going to go into the, the develop, okay, dev stage where we do the unit testing and the compilation. So, um, so we're going to check out the, uh, from the Git repository. So this is the URL we are passing in coming from variable. For this demo, I have a repository locally, but imagine this would be your corporate repository. Uh, the reason we have the steps prefix right now is so that we could distinguish the built-in from the uh, things that's coming in from other plugins. Uh, this syntax we might need to, this is feeling more and more like agri now, so I'm really tempted to get rid of that. So there, there might be some syntax change down the road. Anyway, so we check out the source code. Oh, actually, I skipped the important part. So this reach.node, what this does is it grabs a new, new slave. In this case, it's actually a master. Or this might be a label as opposed to the name of the slave. And then while this block is in scope, this block would run all the way down, actually. The scrolling, falling down to the, the end of the page. Uh, while the, in the, they execute this scope while like, you know, working on this slave. So when I do this checkout here, what I'm really doing is checking out into the, uh, some workspace of the master. Um, and then I run the Maven to clean things up. I mean, they do the build. And then when the build is done, I'm going to just archive that raw file. Um, and then, so that's the build, like a unit, uh, the dev stage. And then, so now I'm entering into the new stage. So really, I'm, by using stage, I'm really just telling Jenkins that here is a queue for providing proper visualization. And the, in the QA phase, 
I got two things going actually. So this parallel step, let me scroll down. Oops. Let me scroll down a little bit. So in the parallel step, I have the one closure here, one block here from until here, and the second block, actually, from here to here, sorry. And the second block from here to there. So I'm running, actually running a two sets of tests. Um, and, um, well, yeah, so two sets of testing here. So what I'm running in here needs a bit of explanation. So you need a, you see a run with server, which is actually a function that I defined down in this workflow. And the idea is that this is going to start a new, actually deploy the web application into a jetty that I'm running. And then um, it gives me a temporary runtime URL. And then so I execute this body block by using that URL as a parameter. So what I'm doing is I'm executing Maven by passing this URL as an option, I apologize for the wrap around at the inconvenient location, but that's generally sort of what's going on. And then when this is over, as you will see later in the definition of this, this run with server, we're going to shut down that Jetty instance. Um, so that's sort of like emulating what I'm talking about earlier as the temporary server instance. And when that, that testing is done, um, so now we're going to go into the uh, staging stage. And then here you see that the concurrency is now restricted to one, meaning only one workflow instance can enter this phase because you know it doesn't make sense to deploy. Well, there's only one staging instance, so it does not make sense to do two at the same time. And so I deploy the app here. That's another function that I, I use see down there. And then here where it gets interesting is like an input statement is basically waiting for the um, uh, the human to come in and approve this. So in this case, I'm just simply asking a yes, no question. All right, so you know, it's a staging environment, so I'm expecting some human to come in and make sure that the things would actually look good and then do the deployment. And um, before I actually go into the production deployment, I want to create that checkpoint here so that if the production deployment fails, I'll be able to just rerun from this point onward as opposed to bring them all the way back up and waste all the testing that has happened. Um, and then in the production deployment stage, what all I do is, um, so I'm getting the another node from here, running some quick sanity test about the instance, um, and then uh, get the file, like unarchive the file, because now I might be actually running on different nodes, even though in this case I only have one master, so this wouldn't happen. But in general case, this might actually happen much later than the build, and so we might not really have the, the file that we archived. So we do the equivalent of the copy artifact plugin. So bring back the file into the workspace from the archives, and then I deploy that. And then they finally, we report that everything is good, and then that's the end of it. And then you see like a, just a few functions down there you know, to make it easier for us to really try to understand what's going on. And this is just trying to show off the ability to build your own abstractions. Um, the run with server is a bit of one of the hairy function here. But you see, for example, since this is just a regular Groovy program, you can mix this kind of you know, random Java code in here. Not always a good idea to do this, but if it's something short like this, then I think it's quite OK. Um, and then so all I'm doing is okay, deploying this web app to the random, con random context pass and then run the test. And then when that's over, run deploy. So you see that I'm, for example, using a try finally block. So this is, a, you, know, you know, we know how the semantics work, but um, the, um, so it makes it easy for you to define this kind of complex uh, semantics without really learning the brand new language. And um, so the, you know, the fact that we are using CPS transformation means even if the execution of the workflow is somewhere inside, uh, we'll be able to still shut down the Jenkins instance and bring it back up and it will continue to do this on the floor. So it's really convenient to be able to define it as, um, as, a, as a series of uh, procedural program. So if I get this guy going, um, so I'm going to schedule a new build. And you, you should hopefully start seeing this uh, building right away. So um, again, you know, the user console output um, and so on. So now this is doing the uh, build now. But um, there's also, we provide this like a preliminary visualization where you see that these are the other steps that's running. Oops. Um, yeah, so these are all the steps that's running and then things that's uh, um, Flashing right now is the step that's under executions. All the log files are separately recorded. So, you know, if you're running stuff in parallel, it does not make much sense to, um, to, 
to uh, look at those things in the single big console output, even though you can if you want to. I think these are actually running integration tests now, so they'll be taking a bit of time, but when they are over, um, when they are over, um, you'll see that the rest of the process is kicking. So let's see. Okay, yeah, so now I think it's getting going to the echo step probably. And then, so we now enter the staging phase and the, um, all right, so now it's sort of pausing at the input statement, which is basically asking for the check. So if I go back to the build page, you see that it needs a approval. Um, so um, I actually, I should probably check if this is actually working. Um, okay, so here. Yes, so it's, it, yes, it's, it's working, so I'm happy. All right, let's, let's, let's deploy this into production. And then so now I give the, the, give the OK. And then so from the point of view of the Groovy program, uh, your workflow program, it looks as if the, that input function has returned. And then so it does go through the rest of the process. And now the build, I think, is build is complete. So that's what this is. All right, so now let's actually, to make this bit more, to shake things up a little bit, what I'm going to do is um, I need to restart Jenkins while this is going on. So, all right, so now the build is happening. All right, quick, I have to restart before this is complete. Um, okay. All right, so now I'm going to just kill the Jenkins instance just like that. Um, all right, then now the whole thing is gone and the Jenkins is still being restarted. Um, well, Maven is, yeah, so now, oh, it's definitely dead, which is, whether good or bad, I don't know. Um, okay, so now it's coming back up. And then so what's going on is, I think, I actually don't remember exactly what he was doing, but let's say if this was forking off Maven and running that integration test, then it'd be basically paused. I mean, the Maven process would keep running while Jenkins is gone. And now that the Jenkins came back, it tried to remember what he was doing, and it redirect where it was. So uh, if you go look into what he was doing, um, yeah, I guess now it's, it's, you see that it keeps on going. So that's the, um, I think that's pretty awesome, isn't it? The fact that you could restore Jenkins. So this is a built-in part of it. All right, and then, um, then what I'm going to do is to, I wanted to show off the, um, I think I have a time for, or maybe I don't, maybe I don't. Um, so I have loved to show you the checkpoint. Well, screw it. I guess the next is a brick, so I guess I can probably run over some time here. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to kill my a, a Jet instance to make the production deployment fail. So remember that the, um, as a part of the pose, um, if I go to build 10, I can um, let it proceed to the deployment. And because I killed Jetty, um, let's see, let me make sure that it's getting, it's dead. Yeah, so it's definitely dead. So the deployment did actually fail. So, um, so now it started going, but, um, but if we let it run for a while, yeah, you see that the deployment has failed because this step has failed. I guess this is probably not very visible, but um, so the reason this has failed um, is because, I think this should work, is because the, um, the, so the sanity check phase has failed because it couldn't connect to the host. Okay, great. So um, if I bring back Jet instance from here, now I'm ready to retry the deployment into the production. So Jet is now back up. Now, um, not sure why the image is dead. Oh, I guess, okay, so it's coming from the internet. So now the, I wanted to retry from here. So I'm gonna go back to the checkpoints that I created earlier, that code before production deployment. So I am going to resume execution from here. And so that is start 11, and then this would start right off. So it skip everything. Uh, it basically copies every step of the way from the previous one, and then it just execute that production part. And then this time it did run to the completion uh, to us uh, all the way successfully. So that's what we could do. And it really makes it easy to recover from there. All right, so that's uh, the quick demo. Um, and um, all right, so the, oh, 30 seconds, jeez. Um, so this is implemented as a bunch of the plugins. So you can, um, 
you can you can go look at the source code if you want. Just a few points about the internal design of things. Um, the the engine, the actual thing that executes this Groovy program is somewhat separated from the rest of the things. So as the Groovy executes stuff, we create a record of what's going on, like, you know, each step, how they are related, what time it, each of the steps took, the log files, any errors, and so on. They are all available in memory as an API. So that allows other plugins, like a visualization plugin, to come in and then build a lot of interesting visualizations, some of which we are hoping to build as a part of the body add into Jenkins Enterprise by CloudBees. And, um, but the, one of, another interesting extension point is called STEP. So this is an API that allows uh, people and other plugins to basically create these things like the function call you saw in. So the git call, shell call, the checkpoint, the archiving, every single functionality you saw, except maybe like a try finally, they all came from this step API. So this is, I think, what we are hoping to become the sort of base foundation for the extensibility of the workflow effort. Um, and so that's basically, that's a key thing. Oh, and then by the way, the, another thing we are fixing, I think this should make some people happy, is that we can allow, you know, we are allowing now you to have multiple checkout step inside a single workflow. So if you need to check out the, and you use the Git plugin three times to check out from three different sources and do all the polling of those, then that totally works now. Um, so I think that should also make some people happy. Um, and then um, we also, you know, pr providing interoperability with the existing stuff. So these SCM plugins, I, we didn't like rewrite anything from scratch for this effort. We just have to, you know, tweak the abstraction a little bit in the core. And that's because we need a, that's why we need a very new version of the core. But otherwise, you know, we, we expect that the over time, all these plugins will be able to, you know, readjust to this new abstraction and then they can be used inside the workflow just fine. And the same thing for the build step and publishers. There's a tons of plugins written to implement the build steps and publishers. We hope to be able to provide a reasonable intro with these guys. Or um, if we want to be able to um, trigger some existing jobs as a part of the workflow, uh, that's, that should be something very easy to do. So um, you don't have to like, throw everything away and use workflow. You could sort of gradually move over as these things become more mature. Um, the other thing that we didn't quite nail, but that's just because we think these are more or less a trivial problem, is the idea that we want to be able to put this workflow inside the version control system. So not just, you know, we, you saw in this demo that I typed in the workflow in your text box, but um, there's a lot of benefit in being able to put this workflow inside the version control system, or being able to create a shared library of these functions. You saw the deploy function and deploy function. Imagine if it's a bit more complex, it'd be really nice to be able to share that with many projects inside Jenkins. So we want, we want you to be able to do that. Um, and then with that kind of setup, you could imagine that the, if you built a sufficient lower level building blocks, people in your product team wouldn't really have to like, know anything about Groovy. They could, they'd be almost programming at the DSL layer that you provide. So for example, the entire example that we saw could have been just reduced down into this single three line, I mean, the, the three line workflow provided that, that I implement this kind of, you know, the convenience function in my shared code. So, so yeah, that's the general idea. We still got a lot more work to do, but as you saw, the basic stuff is already working. Um, and then, so this plugin, I think, is already for people to, to try out. Um, and then, so it's open source. You can go see there and then look at the source code. Uh, the, the DCs are on the Experimental Update Center. If you search for the Jenkins Experimental Update Center, you will see the instructions of how to use that on your Jenkins instance. Um, because some of these changes actually cuts pretty deep in the Jenkins core, like SCM abstraction. It needs a pretty new version of the core. But I think you know, in the current pace of LTS, I think this should hit the LTS within, uh, within this year or something like that. Um, so we are still working on it, but they, our current target is to get to like a one no production level release within this year. And we think that the syntax of the uh, workflow should stabilize a lot before that. So you could start ramping up the workflow effort, and they, by the time you're ready to deploy it inside your organization, I think we have a bit to cover you. So that's it. That's the, um, that's the uh, sort of my part of it. 
So in, in this talk, we covered a lot here. You know, the hybrid covered about the jockey and the, I mean, Jenkins Enterprise a little bit. I think there's a lot of interesting ideas and sensible approach to you know, our program into building large-scale deployment. And the, uh, if you're more like an OSS RD adapter kind of guy, I think the workflow should be really interesting to you. So yeah, I think that's it. Um, so I'm sorry I ran out of time a little bit, but if you have any questions, we'd be happy to take it.